Well, good morning, everyone. Hey, all across Central Land, wherever you are, if you're online or you're in another campus or if you're here in the room with me, man, uh, it is always, always, always good to see you. Look forward to the weekend and a chance when we get to be together. So welcome to all of you. Um, hey, so I want to tell you what we're going to start next week. We're going to start a brand new series and um, it, it's going to be on prayer. Now, hang on, hang on. OK, be, because we're, we're going to talk about a prayer that you have memorized. And you go, I don't have any prayers memorized. Well, go out. Well, there's a couple of prayers you actually do have memorized. One of them starts like this. Now I lay me. Can, can you do it? Yeah, that's not the one we're going to visit. And the other one, uh, you, you know, but you probably don't know that you know it or you know parts of it, but you don't know the whole thing. Or sometimes you, you know it one way and they say it another way. It's called the Lord's Prayer. And uh, Jesus was asked, teach us to pray. And so uh, he, he said, our Father who art in heaven. And again, my guess is you can just go from there. So we're going to talk about that prayer and we're going to break it down because the truth of the matter is, is while you might know the words, you might not know the meaning. And so we're going to try to look at that prayer, uh, take several weeks to do that. Look at that prayer through the eyes of Jesus and begin to understand what he was trying to convey to us in that marriage. But today what we're going to do is we're going to wrap up a series we have been in for the last six weeks. It's called All In Together. And uh, we're talking about the difference we can make as a church if we made our minds up. And so that's what we're going to do today. I want to begin by telling you about a lady that my guess is most of you have never heard of this lady. Uh, you, you've never, never heard of her. Okay. Um, uh, her name is Hetty Green and uh, she lived in the 1800s into the early 1900s. And uh, she was a businesswoman who um, made an absolute fortune in the stock market, okay? Uh, which was remarkable for her at that era, uh, but she was known literally as the Warren Buffett of her day. Uh, she amassed a fortune that was equivalent to about, uh, there she is right there. Um, she amassed a fortune that today would be worth about $2.6 billion, but that might not seem huge by, you know, some of the Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates numbers, uh, Elon Musk, but a different day, different economy. In fact, she was known as the wealthiest woman in the world. That was one. She, there's a number of titles that she's been given. Uh, wealthiest woman in the world is the most complimentary thing that anybody ever said about her. Uh, there were some less uh, kind uh, things that got passed on. Now, we started this series by talking about legacy, and I told you that your legacy is being written by you right now. It will be saved when you die. Once you die, you're not going to change it. You're not going to edit it. You're not going to improve it. You're not going it, to, it's going to be, it's just going to be saved. It's going to be remembered, okay? And when your name comes up, like I'm talking about her right now, your legacy is what you're going to talk about. So the, the kindest thing is she's the wealthiest woman in the world. She was also known as the witch of Wall Street. Isn't that awesome? The witch of Wall Street. She got that title because of her business transactions. She was really, uh, she was a pistol to deal with and very shrewd. But uh, she also was known as the witch of Wall Street because when her husband died, she always dressed in black or primarily dressed in black would be a little bit more accurate. And so <clears throat> she kind of had that witch look. And so they called her that, the Witch of Wall Street. Um, <clears throat> that's not the only title though. So wealthiest woman in the world, the Witch of Wall Street, third one. Uh, and this is, she's actually been listed in the Guinness Book of World Records. The <laughs> Guinness Book of World Records acknowledged her as the greatest miser of all times. Now, I don't know if you know what a miser is. A miser, and it's not a word we use a lot. It's kind of the root of miserable. Um, miser is when all you do is look out for yourself. Uh, miser is uh, I'm going to hoard. I'm going to keep. I'm not going to share. I'm going to just, I'm going to me, 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 me. And uh, I won't give anything away to anybody. <clears throat> There's another title that is really not complimentary at all. I'm going to share it with you. Um, some people know her by another. Okay, so she's the wealthiest woman in the world, kindest thing you can say, the witch of Wall Street, the world's greatest miser, and she is also known as the world's worst mother. This is true. World's worst mother. Now, why would she be called the world's worst mother? It all comes down to an event that happened when she had a couple of kids. But one of her kids was a boy. His name was Ned. One day he was out um, playing in the snow with a sled cut his leg open really badly and obviously needed to get some medical attention. So she took him to a free clinic 
and uh, basically said, I'm going to get you help, but I'm not going to pay anything. Took him to a free clinic, and the doctor recognized her as the wealthiest woman in the world and basically said, I'm not going to waste my time and my limited resources on you. When I'm trying to help people who don't have, you need to go pay for help. And she, they, the doctor kicked, it, kicked him out. And so she was so upset, she refused to actually then take him to a real doctor. She wouldn't do it. And uh, what ended up happening is she just ignored the wound. The wound ended up becoming infected with gangrene and her son Ned's leg had to be amputated. It had to be amputated and he spent the rest of his adult life walking around on a cork prosthesis because mom uh, wouldn't pay a doctor to actually get me help. What in the world would possess, I mean, what causes somebody to be so careless, so uh, like absolutely thoughtless about the hurts and suffering of another human being? Much, I mean, anybody, much less your very own son. Well, there's only one thing that would do that and uh, dress it up however you want. What was her motivation? Why would she not do that? Because of one word and that word is greed. Greed. Um, greed is just this thing uh, that we all, we all struggle with. I do, you do, we all do. Uh, this greed is that I want to hang on to what I have and I don't want to resource it to anybody else. I don't want anyone else to have any access to the things that I have. Let me give you the psychology today definition of greed. Um, this comes out of the magazine. This is, uh, I think, a very interesting. Um, what is greed? Greed is the disordered desire for more than is decent or deserved. Not for the greater good, but for one's own self-interest and at the detriment of others and society at large. Greed can be for anything, but it's most commonly for food, money, possessions, power, fame, status, attention, admiration, and sex. I, I want to just say this statement, and, and you're free to disagree, but I think greed is a prevailing value of our culture. I, like this desire for more, enough's never enough. I need, I need more, I need more, I need more. We are so uh, saturated with that. It, it comes back to that thing that Gordon Gecko famously said, greed is good. And, and the idea that, that there's nothing wrong with this. This is how you ought to be. And it's so much a part of our DNA as a culture. We don't even see it. We don't even notice it anymore. Uh, here's a couple more things I would say about greed. Greed is a refusal to consider what you already have to be enough. Now, everybody would go, I, uh, that, yeah, I kind of struggle with that. And so I, I do want to just make sure you understand. I, I'm not throwing rocks at us because uh, of greed. I, I'm just simply going, can we just admit that we all have a tendency to just want more and more and more. And, and the second one that I would throw out there would be this. Um, it's a vote against contentment. Greed is a vote against contentment. Uh, I, I could be happy and grateful for what I have, but I'm not. And I'm, I'm choosing, uh, I want more. And it's this uh, unrelenting pursuit of more. Now, in our culture, um, this is not challenged. In fact, every advertisement you see is trying to make you discontent with your life and the way it is. It drives so much of our uh, economics, you know, kind of cycle is this endless pursuit of more, you know, a December to remember, all of this kind of stuff, more, 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 and um, it can get pretty ridiculous. Now, our culture doesn't question it and our culture doesn't challenge it, but I want you to understand something. If you are a God follower, if you are a Christ follower, if you are a person who would consider yourself biblically spiritual, I need you to understand the Bible challenges that, the Father challenges that, and Jesus challenges that. In fact, I would make this statement, nowhere in the Bible is greed ever commended as good. At no point ever is it ever held up as a virtue. It is uh, exactly the opposite. And, and you might know greed as the second of the you know, seven deadly sins. It's never a good thing, except in our culture. So in the Bible, it's just no, never celebrated, always condemned, always confronted and, uh, and dealt with. Now, the opposite of greed is held up virtuously. The opposite of greed is exalted as something we should pursue, and it would be generosity. It would be the opposite. It would be this willingness to let go of stuff and, 
and uh, give stuff to others. So generosity. In fact, I think you can make a very, very simple case that generosity is the cure for greed. Generosity is what loosens the, the grip of, of greed when you basically go, I'm not going to value this. I'm not going to care about this. All right. Uh, and by the way, greed is always at our door, uh, knocking and seeking and hoping that we'll open the door um, to it. All right. Now, I want to point out two things that I've discovered by observation. All right. Two things. No one ever, I mean, like pretty much no one ever, like never, ever, ever does anyone tend to call himself greedy. No one just comes out and says, you know what? My biggest sin is greed. My biggest problem is I, I just can't ever get enough. My biggest problem, say, Greed is, it's kind of like it's acknowledged it exists, but it's not anything that anyone wants to claim for themselves. Greed. Uh, uh, now, the flip side of it that I would say, pretty much no one thinks of themselves as being greedy, but here's the flip side. Just about everyone, including you, including me, thinks of themselves as generous. Isn't that just a little bit fascinating? Everybody tends to see themselves favorably when it comes to this issue Nobody wants to see themselves in the light of being greedy. We, we understand it's not good, so we want to be generous by, but here's the problem. If you call yourself generous, at some point you have to have some objective, like somebody else outside of you has to acknowledge they're generous. It's one of those things where it's kind of like, are you a better than average driver? Well, we know this thing exists called the self-serving bias, and a self-serving bias is when you always answer the question in your best self-serving way. So here, here's what they know. Uh, are you a better than average driver? 95% of people when asked that question say, yes, I am. The problem is you can't be 95% better than average. 50% are better and 50% are worse. But we don't see ourselves as the 50% worse. We see ourselves as, I'm generous. The question is, does God see you as generous? Do people who know you see you as generous? Or would they say the truth of the matter is that person is greedy? Now, again, there's just something that you've got to wrestle with this, all right? I've asked you this question before, and I just want to bring it back because I think it's very relevant. What we're talking about is um, a stinginess, a selfishness, all right? Now, my guess is that that is a deplorable trait when you see it in somebody else. So let me ask you the simple question. Who is your all-time favorite selfish person? And if you're normal, you would go, are you kidding? I don't know any selfish person that I even like. I, I can't stand selfish people, but I'm going to push. I'm going to go, yes, you can. You have a favorite. And so do I. Because you know who your favorite selfish person is? Your, favorite, your selfish person is my selfish. In other words, my favorite selfish person is me. And your favorite selfish person is what? You. You are the only selfish person you can stand to be in the presence of. And you justify it every single time it rears its ugly head as to here's why it's okay. You would never say that about somebody else, but you would say that about you. That's the reality of what we're talking about here. It's very, very blinding. Now, the only way that I think we're ever going to understand generosity objectively is to look at ourselves through a mirror that will not lie to us, that will tell us the truth as it actually exists. And I want to suggest to you that there is no better mirror to see yourself accurately than the Word of God. So when you take the Bible and you stare at it and you listen to what it says, and it says a lot about generosity, again, always positive. But when you do that, you see yourself in a different light and, and pretty soon you start going, okay, I, 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 well, let me just show you what I'm talking about. Okay, so let me give you a couple things. Here's the first thing I want you to know. God is always pleased when he sees generosity in his children. God's always pleased. You just need to know that. And let me read a passage. Hebrews 13, 16. Do not forget to do good and share with others. For with such sacrifices, God is pleased. Now, now that's not hard to understand. I want you to just simply think about, um, like when you, uh, if you're a parent and you had kids, had or have kids that are in the house, one of the things that you understand about your kids is they're, they're like predetermined. They're, they're like preloaded with the, the software to be very, very, you know, selfish. And, and so a favorite word of a kid is mine. 
Mine means not yours. Mine means get your hands off of it. Mine means back off. Mine it comes so naturally to a kid. Mine, 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 mine. And, and yet every parent knows the joy. Yeah, I mean, you've seen all the battles, you've seen all the fights, you've seen, you know, all the boundary lines. But there's a joy when one of your kids just voluntarily just gives up something. They, they see their brother wants a toy here. And what do you do as a parent? Oh, get the camera. I got to remember this. I've never seen this. The coolest kid ever. Oh, sweetie. And what do you say to your kid? I'm so, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of you, man. I just, oh. Do you think God is indifferent? See, God sees stinginess, and I won't share, and he just goes, oh, please tell me you're not my kid, right? But when you give and you share and you're not stingy, he goes, that's my, that's my boy, that's my girl. Here's the second thing I'll tell you the Word of God says. God will reward generous people. I just need you to understand this. God will reward generous people. Psalm 112, 5 and 6, good will come to him who is generous and lends freely, who conducts his affairs with justice, surely he will never be shaken. A righteous man will be remembered forever. God will reward it. Now, Proverbs eleven twenty five: 25, a generous man will prosper. Totally counterintuitive. A generous man will go broke. No, no, no. <clears throat> God goes, no, no. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Why will that happen? Because God sees what his children do to one another. And when he sees generosity, it pleases him. And he rewards it. Here's the third one. Since God generously provides for us, he commands generosity from us. I think some of us are not generous because we don't understand we were commanded to be generous. See, a lot of us look at generosity as an option. Generosity is a, okay, well, I could be, but I don't need to be. If you are a person who is after God's heart, if you've been forgiven, you have been the recipient of the most incredibly generous I mean, you couldn't find a salvation and a grace more generous than what God's poured out on you. I just need you to understand, once you've experienced it, he expects it. It's his standard. That's how he works. And so the word of God is really, really clear. And, and uh, Timothy was a preacher. Paul was his mentor. And Paul is teaching him, uh, like, how to be a pastor of a church. And he was a pastor in Ephesus. In 1 Timothy 6, 7, uh, 6 17, command those who are rich, okay, this is what, what? Command those who are rich in this present world. Woo! Glad he's not talking to us. <clears throat> Folks, all you got to do is a tad bit of research to understand there is no one more rich than you in this world. It's just where you were born at the time you were born and us as a country. You can never point the finger and go, I'm glad I'm not like them because all the rest of the world's pointing at us and going, you're the them. So command them who are rich in this present world uh, not to be arrogant, look at how much I got, or to put their hope in wealth. Your securities become your security, uh, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who provides richly, provides us, provides us with everything for our enjoyment. God is the source and he gives you this stuff and you start to realize it's, um, it's from him. Here's another thing I want to tell you the Bible says about generosity. It will echo into eternity. We don't think about this. Your acts of generosity will live on after you. Um, First Timothy six, the same passage is farther down. Command them. So Timothy, you command them not to put their confidence in one. Command them to do good, to be rich in good deeds and to be generous and willing to share. In this way, they will lay up treasure for themselves as a firm foundation for the coming age so that they may take hold of the life that is truly life. The life that I always wanted my people to have comes through generosity. Teach them, command them. Don't let them get away with selfishness. Don't let them be stingy. You teach them, strongly teach them that this is how it works and that it will echo through all eternity. Here, here's another one. I just, this will be the last of the scripture I'll throw out here. Uh, there, and again, I'm just cherry picking some. There's a lot of these. Um, I want you to understand something. Uh, those who sow generosity reap generosity. And this is a very, very important principle. Those who sow generosity reap generosity. 
Those who sow selfishness reap selfishness. All right, here, here, here we go. Second Corinthians nine. Let me read this. This passage. Just listen, okay? Remember this: whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. So if you if you're sowing, you're just putting a few seeds out there. Guess what? The harvest of that is going to be a few little you know plants, whatever you were sowing. If you sow generously, you reap generously is the idea. If you sow sparingly. So whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will also reap generously. Now each man, that's you, that's me, okay? Man, woman, it's it's not only the men, all right? Um, Each man should give whatever he has decided in his heart to give, not reluctantly or under compulsion. God takes no joy in your stinginess and him having to twist your arm to let something go. No more than you would enjoy taking your kid's arm, twisting it until he releases something that he won't share. God's going, that's not what I'm looking for. So God's not interested in making you feel guilty. He's not making you feel like I feel horrible. So the only reason I'm doing this is because, no, he's going, I, I, I want cheerful givers. And by the, word, by the way, the word cheerful is the word hilarious. The idea that you, could, you find joy, it makes you, it, just, it tingles your soul. I love doing this. And I know that might sound like miles, like that can't even happen. But God says, not reluctantly or in a compulsion, for he loves a cheerful giver. And God is able, now listen, now God is able to make all grace abound to you so that in all things, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, he has scattered abroad his gifts to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be made rich in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving. Now, you'll be rich in every way so you can be generous on every occasion. What does that mean? A lot of people would say, I can't give anything because I don't have anything to give. Here's the problem with that. God's word says everything you have, you have because God has given it to you. He's placed it in your hand. And, 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 and let me say it to you this way. God is the source of all good things. So you can be the resource for all good things. God is the source. It came from him. He gave it to you so that you could give it so you could become the resource. And when you say, I have no resource, what you're saying is everything God put in my hands, I've consumed. Welcome, Hetty. That's the problem. That's the problem. We take everything God gave us. goes, me, mine, 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 mine. Nobody else. Not even my son. Nobody else. This is the problem. God goes, I didn't give you all of that so that you could hoard all of that. So <clears throat> here's the big idea. Big, I'm going to call this big idea number one because I'm going to follow with a second big idea. This is the big idea. One. Ready? <clears throat> we reveal who we really are by what we do with what we have. Gotta let that soak. We reveal who we really are by what we do with what we have. You can call yourself generous. You can call yourself magnanimous. You could call yourself, you know, I'm grateful. You reveal who you really are by what you do with what you have. This is why it is so uncomfortable for us to talk about money because it's very convicting because the word of God is crystal clear on this. It reveals, it reveals. Now, give you the second big idea. This is very important as you understand. Ministry happens only through the generosity of those who know they are blessed. What does that mean? It means ministry happens only through the generosity of people who acknowledge that God gave it to them. They were blessed. Because see, if you don't think you're blessed and, and you think it's okay to hoard everything that God put in your hands, you're not going to equip anyone for ministry. You're not going to do anything to help other people. Ministry exists because people who know God's been good to them go, I'm passing it along. I'm not going to hoard all this. I'm not going to keep it all for myself. I'm going to take care of other people. I'm going to refresh other people. But only Generous people will ever do that. In fact, I would take it even further. I would say this. Generosity is the purest expression of gratitude. Generosity is the purest expression of gratitude. For you to be generous, you got to be thankful. And if you're not thankful, listen, you're not going to be generous. What do I have to be generous? Who do I have to be thankful for? 
I did all this on my own. There's no, there's no gratefulness there. Generosity gets to the heart, which is why God talks about it so much. It reveals who we really are with what I did. Now, for the last five plus now six weeks, I have asked you to consider stepping up and getting on the field, getting in the game. I have asked, well, I don't care if you're a high school kid, I don't care if you're a junior high kid, I don't care if you're a senior adult. Here's the problem. Many of us want to just sit on our butts in the stands and watch people do ministry. We want them to do it and we want them to fund it. I have done everything I know how to do over the last six weeks to try my hardest to get you to care about people. It's not you, it's about somebody else. I, I, I don't know how else to say it. That's what generosity is. Generosity is when you do something good for the benefit of somebody. Generosity is when you're willing to plant a tree that you know you will never be around long enough to enjoy the shade of. Or you're going to plant a tree that you know you will never be around long enough to enjoy the fruit of. I'm not doing it for me. I'm doing it for somebody else. I'm doing it for so somebody who's going to come later. And I have been pleading with you and, and it's been an uphill swim, by the way. I mean, it literally been like rowing the canoe uphill. The kayaks going there, you know, it's hard because it is so much in us to care about us, not them. I'm pleading with you, church, to care about single moms. I don't know how to tell you. I think God really cares about them. I don't think we do. I've been pleading with you. Can we care about, I, I don't think we care about children the way God cares about children. I think we care about children, but I don't think we care about children. If we cared about children the way God cared about children, I think we'd prioritize some things a little bit differently. I, I, and I think if we cared about children the way God cares, we'd have some very cool going on for kids with special needs. Well, we don't. Well, I, I think we would provide the best facilities for them to meet in. We don't. I, so I'm just pleading with you. I'm, I'm pleading with you to care for the homeless, the houseless the people that don't have anywhere to sleep. I'm pleading with you to care. I'm pleading with you to care for those who are hurting uh, with just the mental struggles they're going, they're, they're, they're struggling through an addiction, through cares ministry. I wanna ask you to help, will you help? For people who are going through the pain of divorce and separation and all this. For people who are trying to overcome the hurts, the habits, the hangups of their life, the pain. I'm going, church, can we care? Can we care? And a ministry only happens to the degree that generous people, you go, why don't we have stuff for all of them? We don't have the resource. Why don't we have the resource? Because God wasn't faithful to us? No, because we weren't faithful to God. We kept what he gave us and we kept it for ourselves. And I hate to be the one to break that. You can get mad at me all, all you want. I, I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but I think we're gonna be held accountable for this. And I'm pleading with you, can we care? Can we care? about people around the world that are gonna to go to hell? Can we care about people in our community that are gonna to go to hell? I am telling you, mark my words, the church in the future will not be able to attract people the way the church in the past has attracted people. We will not, the world will not listen to the message of the church if the church doesn't do something to bless the world. And guys, I'm just telling you, it's what's coming. So why am I so passionate about it? I wanna create a place for people to come and, and on our campus here on Gilbert is we're running a pilot program. I want to create a place where people who don't go to church can go to church and experience a place to sit and have a cup of coffee and relax and their kids can play on the playground. Sports things that are happening for them, a, a place for them to have a meeting off that we'll just provide for them. The church will benefit from it, but I'm going, it's not for us, it's for them. Why am I so because I truly believe that we cannot get there without our willingness to be generous and to overcome our greed. So, ministry happens only through the generosity of those who are blessed. Now, I wanna explain a concept that I think is important. I've spent no time on this, but I wanna explain something. And again, I want you to hear me as your pastor. Here's a problem that we have in churches. People wanna give with strings attached. And they can manipulate people with strings attached to their giving. We made a decision, we're moving away from that. We're going to a one fund. What's a one fund? A one fund is a one, all the money goes into one fund, all ministries get resourced off that, off that one fund. 
The idea of a one fund is you don't keep taking up special offerings, but the flip side of it is you don't turn around and start going, you know what I really care about? I really care about this. So I'm going to give this so that I'm going to give so that you will buy a piano for the stage. I'll give you this money on the condition. That's not giving. That's manipulating. Uh, I, I want to give to this fund or to that fund, a benevolent, a building fund, the children. I, don't, I only want my money to go. That's not giving. And as a church, we're just going to go, you know what, we're going to stop that. Non just like we stopped the passing of trays because that's not the way to give. We're stopping this nonsense. If you're going to give, let go. And, and, and I, I address this about three weeks. Well, I don't know if I can trust the church. Look, look, I get that. I understand why you might say that. If you don't trust this church, would you please go find one you can? If you don't trust the leadership to be people of integrity of this church, go find one. Don't come here. If you really believe that our motive is to misuse your resource that you trusted us with, please don't come to church here for your sake, not ours, for your sake. But we're not going to accept gifts with strings attached. If you want to give, let go. If you didn't let go, you never gave. So we're trying to be really clear. It's one fun. The, but the flip side is I'm not going to stand up in front of you and go, hey, man, there's a, there's a hurricane in Florida. We're going to take up a special offering. The leadership will determine whether out of our one fund, we should cut some resource towards whatever. In fact, the last, like all corporate offering we plan to take is uh, the, what we're calling the first fruits offering, which is the beginning of this thing, which comes on, on Easter, <coughs> where we literally are going to ask you to help us get this thing moving and seed it with some money. But that's going to be it. No more Christmas, no it's just not the way we're going to do it. And we're not going to keep pleading for that. Now, I got I to gotta finish. So let me, let me get really personal. Now, if you've been around here, you've heard what I'm about to tell you. But I, I, I really want to explain something because you, you could be sitting here going, I do not understand what's his motive and why is he trying to get us to be so generous? Okay, and I don't know what you're thinking. I've already told you, I get no cut of the offering. I, I don't work on commission. So you can dismiss that. Well, he's trying to set himself up for the, a, a really wealthy future. Folks, I won't be your pastor for much longer. That's not my motive. Why am I so passionate? Because people who have experienced extreme generosity get extremely passionate about generosity. And I'm that person. Let me tell you my story. I um, grew up without a dad. I grew up with a mom, who, a single mom who did her best. But when I got to college, uh, those years, I graduated high school and she was very, very clear to me. I have no resource to send you to college. I need to make sure you understand that. Okay. So if you're going to go to college, you're going to have to figure out a way. Oh, okay. I got it. So I applied for every grant. I applied for every scholarship. I applied for loans. I t got a job. I did everything I knew how to do to get myself through college. Now I was going to go to ASU. I was going to go into engineering. And I decided I want to go to a Christian college and learn the Bible. I had no intention of going into the ministry. I want to go learn the Bible. And then I'm going to go pursue. So I enrolled in a Christian college, Pacific Christian College in, in uh, Fullerton, California. And uh, I headed off, man. I was so excited. My mom said, you need to understand. I got, I got it, mom. I'm just going to trust God to provide. Well, it was, I don't remember exactly. It was 10 days to 14 days into the burn. I got a note on my little mailbox there in the lobby and it said, um, hey, uh, you need to see the business office. So I took my little note and went to the business office and said, hey, I got a note I'm supposed to see. And it was a lady who was in charge of all the money. And she sat me down, she was very nice. I have no animosity towards her, but she said, I need to explain something to you. You don't have enough to attend college. I, I go, well, I've got a, a Pell Grant and, and I got this loan and I got this and I got, and she says, I know it's just not enough. And I go, well, what are you saying? Well, you can know what she's saying. She's going, if you don't get this up, we, we, what you're trying to purchase is an education. It costs more than this. And I'm like, oh. And so she broke it down for me. She said, here's what you need to understand. If you can't come up with more money, you, you can't be a student here. So I want you to go, and this is what she said to me, I want you to go, I want you to pray over this weekend about everyone you know who you could ask to help you get through college. And I just started laughing. And she said, come back on Monday and tell me what you 
discovered. I said, I don't need to come back on Monday. I have tapped everyone I know how. I've asked for everyone who, I, I don't have any other. She said, you go pray about it. Come. I go, I don't need, let's just kick me out now. Cause that's what's gonna happen on Monday. She says, you go pray about it. I'm like, okay, this is ridiculous. So I walk out. I'm not mad, I'm frustrated, I'm flustered, I'm confused. I really believe I'm supposed to be there, but I don't have a way to pay for it. My mom's not gonna be able to help me, I know that. So I, I go and I plop myself down. Uh, in between two dorms, there was a pool and they have lawn chairs. So I plop myself down on this lawn chair and I remember I just kind of laid back and I was just kind of, I, I, just, I just remember going, God, I don't get it, I don't get it. All I want to do is serve you. That's all. I don't know. Maybe it was ridiculous, this idea that I feel like you put in my head. So while I'm sitting there in agony, uh, somebody comes and sits down right next to me. I look over. She's obviously not a college student. All right. It's an older lady. I look at her and like, where did you come from? And uh, she says to me, you look distraught. I go, well, that's interesting because I am a bit. And she said, what's going on? And I, I remember I did everything I knew how to do to get this lady to leave me alone. Just please leave me alone. And she wouldn't leave me alone. And she just coaxed out what just happened. She got it out of me. And she said, so that's the problem. I go, yeah, that's the problem. So I'm gonna go in on Monday and I'm gonna drop out. And, I, and she says, can I at least pray for you? Please, please, please pray for me. So she prayed for me. I go in on Monday, I'm, I'm packing up and I, I, there's no way. So just how do I drop out of college? I've never done this before. How do you do it? So I go into the same lady that was the lady that talked to me on Friday in the business office. I said, hey, okay, I've done everything. I, I know, I told you on Friday. I had a, and she goes, she goes, you're good. And I looked at her and I said, I don't know like what you mean by good, but what I am is not. That's not. And she goes, no, no, you're good. I go, what do you mean I'm good? I'm not good. She goes, yeah, you're good. Now you're figuring this out a lot faster than I did. She goes, it's taken care of. And I am so confused. I go, what is taken care of? She goes, your tuition is taken care of. And I'm looking at her and I'm like, I'm like, what do you mean? I don't understand. She goes, it's covered. I go, it can't be covered. She goes, it's covered. It uh, was, uh, I'll tell you how slow I am. It took me about two years to figure this out. For all four years, because I didn't end up going to ASU, I ended up becoming a pastor because I didn't have to quit in the first 10 days because a lady stepped forward, her name was Lois Rayburn and her and her husband, Harold, lived in Los Alamos, New Mexico, and they had a passion to be generous to people because they wanted to invest in the future of the church. Guys, I just need you to understand, I wouldn't be here today if Harold and Lois Rayburn hadn't been there then. They took care of that all four years and I got there. I got here because she was there I got through that, which was part of the journey. Why am I so passionate pleading with you to be generous? Because guys, I'm telling you, that's where the life that is truly life is lived. And just, so I, and I don't know how to say this any more clearly than I'm saying, if you think I'm just blowing smoke at you, Lisa and I are, we are making a commitment. We have given for the past, and I, I'm, I don't know the number, for the last 15 years, we've given over 15% of our income to the church. We give to other things, to the church. We're gonna increase that to over 25%. I'm gonna take on, we, we commit, Lisa and I, to another tithe over the next two years. That's, so don't look at me and go, he's just trying to get something out of us. No, 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 no. I got lots of other things I could be doing with that money. But I wouldn't be here today if Harold and Lois Rayburn didn't know what it meant that all ministry happens because people who know they're blessed give. So church, I'm just calling you to your best you, to a life that's different, to a life that's higher, that's better. Now I want to explain something. We're not going to be able to do anything different until we know that our people will come forward and that they will actually give additionally, because which I've told you this before, we know we're going to get about 33 million because that's what you give in a two year period 
But what I've been talking to you about takes about 56 million. So we're talking about an additional 23 million. You go, there's no way. Okay, I, I refuse to believe that we don't have that kind of resource. I refuse to believe that. We might not be willing to give it, and that's a different issue, but it's not that we don't have it. We have it. But here's the deal. We can't do anything until you commit that you'll make a difference and you'll get out of the stands and get onto the field. And I, for some of you, it's just some of you, just $10 a week, just start there, man. Just start there. And for some, that's ridiculous. That's so far beneath what you're capable of. I don't know. I'm telling you what Lisa and I are committing to do. And I'm just going, hey, you just do whatever you believe God wanted you to do and we'll be good. And whatever we get, and by the way, millions have already been committed to this, just so you know. Whatever we end up with, that's as much ministry as we'll do. Well, what if we don't? Then we won't be able to do certain things. I don't know how else to tell you. Ministry is fed. It's the fuel of ministry is the giving of generous people. That's all we got. We have no investments. We don't get a return from Dean Witter. You know, we don't get any of that. We have what you give. So a couple of weeks ago, I told you about this card. We handed you this card last week. There's a card in the pew back in front of you the, the uh, seat in front of you. I believe this is true on all campuses. I don't know that, but here's what I'm gonna ask you to do. We're gonna have a very sacred moment of commitment and only if you want to. If, if you feel like I'm guilting you and I'm manipulating you and I'm somehow working your emotions, if you think that's what's going on, then don't give a dime to this. Don't listen to me, but I plead with you to listen to God. Well, do whatever God told you to do. Be faithful to him, not me. Be faithful to him. And I promise you, if you are and you will do that, you will not be disappointed. You know who's going to be disappointed? Those who just walk out of here just like you walked in. You were just the same person after all of this as you were. But you know who's going to walk out blessed? To those who decide, you know what, I'm going to trust God to be the source of all I need so that I can resource all he wants. So, what I'm going to ask you to do is I'm going to ask you to um, watch a video. Uh, it's going to explain how to fill out this card. I'm going to ask you to do a couple things. I'm going to plead with you. I'm going to plead here and I'm pleading there. And if you're at home, I, you know, don't you dare walk out. Um, here's what I'm going to ask you to do is just stay here for the end of the service. There's going to be some cool things. We're going to, we're going to ask you uh, to watch this video. And then I'm going, to, I'm going to ask you to do something with that card. So this is uh, Michelle Anderson. She is our CFO. And uh, she is going to explain, she's the head of all of the accounting of the church, um, how, how this card works. So give her your attention for just a moment. Hello, Central family. I'm Michelle Anderson, the CFO here at Central. I can't tell you how excited I am about the vision of where Central is going and the incredible journey that we are about to embark on with the One Fund campaign. This isn't your typical capital campaign. It's a unique opportunity for all of us to join hands in making a lasting impact. Now let's talk about filling out that commitment card. I understand that this could be a bit confusing, but I'm here to guide you through it with some examples. On the first line, simply jot down your regular annual contribution. And don't worry if you're just starting out your giving journey. It is absolutely okay to put a zero here. We all have to start somewhere, right? Let's imagine that you're feeling that nudge from God to begin with your giving journey. You decide to commit $100 per month, totaling that to $1,200 per year. Multiply that by two years and you've got a commitment of $2,400. The next section is for accumulated resources. Perhaps you've been saving up for a vacation that you can put off for a bit longer, or you'll be receiving a bonus from your company, or even you have stock that you can transfer over to Central without paying taxes that you'd like to contribute. Say you have about $5,000 in accumulated resources. Add that to your initial commitment and your total gift becomes a generous $7,400. Now picture a couple who are faithful tithers. The couple together makes $90,000 a year, so their annual giving is $9,000. Together they've prayed and they've felt led to increase their giving by $1,000. Now they're committed to $10,000 per year. 
Multiply that by two years and their total commitment becomes an inspiring $20,000. Let's say they have a motorcycle that they don't use anymore because they're starting a family, or they have a boat that they wanna sell because they really don't go to the lake as much anymore. From selling an item, let's say that they add another $10,000 to their accumulated resources. And then their overall gift skyrockets to an amazing $30,000. You see, it's a personal journey and you know best what works for you. I encourage you to seek God's guidance as you fill out your commitment card. Our goal is 100% participation, even from the students. Whether it's taking that initial step or pushing beyond your current giving, challenge yourself and see what incredible transformations await, both within Central and the thousands of lives that will touch beyond these walls. I can hardly wait to see and witness the incredible impact that we will make when we go all in together. Last week I explained <clears throat> that to sacrifice means to give up something you love for something you love more. Um, I, I got lots of uses for money, just like you do. But when it all comes down to it, I feel like God's given us a certain amount for your use and he's given us a certain amount for the benefit of others. And um, what we're saying is, will you, will you clear away some of the clutter and get focused? Now, here's the deal. When I tell you what we're gonna do, I don't have the least worry about doing that. I just need you to understand that. I got like no anxiety over it. And here's why. God's never disappointed. God's never failed to, to be the source when I've committed to be the resource. I don't, I'm not worried about it. God, God will take care of it. So I'm gonna ask you to step out in faith. And again, I can't make you do it. And if you don't wanna do it, don't do it. But I do wanna challenge you to do it. Now, I wanna be really clear. If you turn a card in, listen carefully, this is important. Turning a pledge in doesn't save a soul. Turning a pledge in doesn't feed a person. It doesn't put somebody off the street. It doesn't help somebody struggling with an addiction. A pledge card does nothing other than it allows us as a church to get a pulse on what our church will be able to do over the next two years. So if you have no intention of fulfilling that, don't walk up here and throw a blank card in there. That is pointless. Just like we don't pass a plate, you don't need to play, you don't need to pretend. But if you know that God is talking to you and that you wanna get onto the field with the rest of us and you wanna get some skin in this game and you want God to use your life to leave a legacy behind you, I'm gonna ask you to do something sacred. And that is to bring that card up. There's baskets up here. I'm gonna ask you to place that card filled out with your name. This is a commitment my family's making and then put it in there. And then I'm gonna come up here in just a few minutes. I'm gonna pray for us to be faithful to what we promised God we do. Uh, God's not gonna let you down. I just wanna plead with you, make a commitment. I'm not gonna let God down. So I'm gonna pray right now and they're gonna lead us in a, a song in just a moment. They're gonna, I'm just, when I get done praying, if you're, if you're ready to get serious with God, then you come up here and you can drop your card in one of these, then go back we're going to have that prayer and then we're gonna end the service on all of our campuses with one particular song. So let me pray and, uh, and then we'll just start moving forward. So God, thank you for what we've experienced in prior services. God, thank you what's gonna happen all across Central Land here uh, this, this weekend. God, thank you for those who have already committed millions to this. I am grateful for their leadership. But God, now it's time for all of us to step up, suit up, get ready and uh, make a difference with our lives. So to a legacy that will bless people that we'll never know, perhaps, but God, that will indeed be blessed by you and you will get the credit and you will get the glory as exactly where it ought to be. So help us to be faithful to you. And I pray this in Jesus' name, amen. Come on down.